Hello and welcome to the latest episode of This Racing Life and we've come down to Oaksey House, one of the most important institutions for the recovery of injured jockeys and we speak to Ed Barrett, a former point-to-point -point rider who was paralysed from the neck down in an accident eight years ago. And we'll also be visiting the Lambourne arm of Baker McVeigh who are taking the veterinary world by storm. Let's rewind the clock a bit and yeah. could you tell us all about the accident and how it happened? Feels like a long time ago now. Um, so I was riding in a point to point down in Devon, um, 12th of April 2015, don't forget that date. And um, fortunately, the horse fell, and I don't actually really know exactly what happened, but I've got a fair idea. Um, and basically, two horses came over the top of me, and the hoof sort of struck my neck, broke my neck, dislocated my neck. And um, I found out later on that a bit of the bone had chipped off and went into my spinal cord. So, yeah, I was on the floor, couldn't move, and uh, I, I knew straight away that I was in big trouble. And um, I, my hat had slipped down from the impact and I couldn't like, lift my arms to move my goggles. So, yeah, it was an awful time. And it doesn't sound to me as though it was much of a blur. You actually remember a fair bit. Yeah, of that I was accident. conscious throughout. I just, just before and after the fence. I don't. It, it happened so quick. I don't really know what happened. Um, but I was just one of the unlucky ones. A freak accident. Um, it's one of those just bad luck f for me, really. And that happened when you were twenty-five. Yeah. Nearly twenty-six. Yeah. And at that stage in your career, you were a, a fairly successful point-to-point -point rider. What, what was the the ambition for you at that point? To be honest. Um, my career at that time wasn't really going anywhere really. I'd, I'd, I was very, you could say I was successful as a point-to-point -point jockey. Um, and then I tried to have a go under rules and it didn't really work out. I soon realised I was a small fish in a big ocean and um, up against it. So I, at the time I was working for Henry Daly as assistant trainer and just coming down to Devon to ride the ones I fancied would do quite well. So. You know, the horse I had my accent on was a good horse. I'd won on him several times before. It wasn't like a first time out maiden. Um, so, so yeah, it just one of those things. Does the fact that it was more of a pastime at that point for you make it a little bit harder to take, that you weren't doing it day in, day out? Looking back now, I, I think you can't play at this game. You've either got to be in it or out, or out of it, and I was. I was trying to do too many things, I think. I was trying to work for Henry as assistant trainer. It was quite a full-on job. And um, I think you can't do both. I think you've either got to be a jockey and you've got to take it seriously and you've got to be really fit and you've got to live, breathe it. I don't think you can do both looking back, but I can't, I can't change that. But um, yeah. It kind of hurts a little bit because I was half thinking, should I should I be stopping now and concentrating on my job? But at the same time, it's very hard to give up. It must be quite a difficult mental obstacle to overcome. Well, the thing is, I still had some nice horses to ride. The, the one particular horse, you know, if you'd have won that day, it'd have probably gone to Cheltenham. Um, and then, you know, you, d you don't know what can happen after that. You, it takes a couple of wins and then your career's back on track and you get going again. But. Um, yeah, it was going to be difficult to take whatever, but um, the fact that I was doing something I loved, it made, made it easier. I saw a lot of people in hospital that just had car, you know, had car accidents and freak accidents like that, and I think that would be harder to take because I was actually doing something I really wanted to do, I enjoyed, I wanted to be a jockey since I was about five years old. Mm -hmm. So in that aspect, I don't, I don't regret not race riding because it's all I wanted to do, but I just didn't have a luck of the draw. And given that you're in Oaksey House, surrounded by plenty of jockeys recovering who are still riding, there's a certain amount of you missed the thrill of, of racing if you wanted to be a jockey ever since you were young. Yeah, a little bit. Miss winning, I suppose. Um, didn't win that much, but <laughs> I missed that. But more really, when you're, in, when you're riding, you're in like a bubble really, and you're with your mates. And um, I, miss, I kind of missed that think that sort of aspect of it more than more than the thrill of winning like it's you you're with your friends every like most of the days and more that side probably most of our patients require uh, 
more physiotherapy um, than actual medical care. So usually they're medically stable, they've been discharged from hospital, their injuries are recovering. Um, so we um, do a lot of intensive physiotherapy and then we move them into the gym where we um, develop their strength and conditioning um, before they get back to racing. But obviously some of these jockeys and some of our retired beneficiaries have far more complex needs um, and I get involved with those patients um, reviewing their needs um, and how we can support them best. Compared to the other two facilities that you've got, this is by far the most advanced, I'm led to believe, is that right? Well, so um, this was the first one to be, um, to be built. So we've been in here since 2009. Um, and obviously we've learned a lot during our time working here. I started actually um, when it was built. Um, in 2009 and at that stage we just had a physiotherapist and a strength and conditioning coach but we've developed massively since then because we realised the needs of the patients coming in so we were starting to get requests from people with spinal injuries um, wanting to come for rehabilitation um, and what we realised was we didn't have the right facilities in place and we had to bring those in so we brought in a specific neuro rehab team um, who have neurophysios, occupational therapists, neuropsychologists, so a whole team that can support those more complex patients. And then they can use our facilities, so they might use the hydrotherapy pool, they might take patients into the gym to work them in the gym, um, and also they have their own area um, within the complex that they can actually treat patients. Um, so yes, we do have more complex patients here at Oaksey House compared to Peter A. Sullivan House and Jack Berry House. Scott joins me, one of the physios here at Oaksey House. Thanks very much indeed for giving us your time. Um, we're currently in the Hydropool room. I've just given an explanation of exactly what the Hydropool does. So the Hydropool is one of the treatments that we use with our jockeys. Um, it basically de-weights people because of the buoyancy of the water. So anyone who's got broken ankles, broken legs, we're able to get them in and start them exercising a lot earlier than they would be able to on land if they're not able to weight bear fully. The water itself is obviously kept at quite a warm temperature between kind of 31 and 33 degrees. And that in itself acts as one, a pain reliever, but also helps with improving blood flow and helping with some of that recovery. And can you have all ranges of injuries coming in here? I, mean, I know there's a, you're equipped for a wheelchair as well. Yeah, so we've got the platform hoist uh, to the side of us there where we're able to get any patients in here, whether they're fully independent walking or whether they're paralyzed neck down um, so we can get them up on the hoist we can then hoist them into the water um, and do therapy with them in the water no matter what the condition. A big part of his recovery has been mental and I imagine if you've got a serious injury the, the mental recovery is, is almost the most important thing. Absolutely well it's at least as important as the physical recovery um, and making that transition between being a a, a full professional jockey with a really busy career and life ahead of you to a completely different life is a massive change um, and even when professional athletes are retiring we all know that that is a really vulnerable time for them um, just coming up to retirement and retiring and then transitioning into their new life um, so it's absolutely vital to have that psychology input. And I think it is quite unusual that people can come and stay here for a prolonged period of time. I know Ed was here for five, six months at a time at one stage, and that can only be vital to improving their, their state physically. Yeah, absolutely. It gives them that opportunity to start to move from that hospital environment when people have their initial injury, they do their rehab in hospital, um, and at some point they have to get discharged. But what we can do here is be that halfway house between moving back into their own home and some of our units especially adapted for pa patients with spinal injuries um, and others have um, uh, extra rooms so that a carer can come or family members can come and stay with them um, for prolonged periods of time. You've got a yeah. very tight-knit family, yeah. uh, very close. So how difficult was it for them to, to adjust to the new life? See I didn't, re I was a bit selfish really, I was thinking about myself but it Rocked. Fair it, enough, it, I would say. Well, no, but it, 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 my mum said to me the other day, um, and she, we, she's only started really talking about it now, but it really rocks their world as much as mine, really. And, and Russ, my brother, he's been really good f for me. He's been like a rock. But two years of his life was put on hold looking after me, like taking me to appointments and, and things like that. So, yeah, you don't realise it affects everyone. It's not just you. Recovery-wise, yeah. how long did it take before you saw some kind of improvement? And when you did, how difficult was it 
to get to that point because when you're trying to learn how to move again, essentially, I yeah. imagine it's incredibly difficult. Well, they say you make you can make recovery for the first two years, like good recovery, and then after that it sort of stops. But I've noticed like little changes since, even like as long as a year ago, I've, I noticed like oh my, I think my foot's lifting a bit better and things like that. Um, so I think the, the first three weeks is when after three weeks you I think you're in spinal shock, and my toes started moving first, and then. They transferred me from Plymouth to um, Oswestry, Street and then I things just started to come back gradually. Um, and I think I was four and a half months living at Oswestry, Street and I was determined to sort of walk out of the hospital really. So I kind of I was still in a wheelchair at that time, but I kind of walked out of the hospital on Zimmer frame just to just so I say I could walk out of here yeah. kind of thing. And then um, I went to Oaksy House, which is I was very lucky to do that because a lot of lads that were sort of in the same hospital bay as me, they just go home to their families and that's like, you know, that's kind of it. Whereas when I came to Oaksy, I was able to carry on the rehab that I was doing in hospital anyway. And I think that's a really big thing because also to give my family time to set things up at home. I lived here for we'll say five months probably. And I was having physio every day, like the physios kept trying to get me to move. I was having like soft tissue massage and and um, now they've got the hydrotherapy pool. So in that hydrotherapy pool, there's now like a treadmill at the bottom. So I was able to walk on that with the water holding you up and had all these, the anti-gravity machine had all these little things that definitely made a huge difference in my recovery. I feel like I've walked into the latest Christopher Nolan sci-fi movie with this, <laughs> the anti-gravity treadmill. It's pretty high tech, isn't it? It's yeah, pretty good and there aren't many of them around the country. A lot of them are in kind of elite level sports, elite level football clubs. Um, so yeah, we're very lucky to have this. How does it work? Because it's, I mean, I don't really know, it's a kind of a felt type cover, isn't it, that people can go in, is that right? Yeah, so you put a pair of shorts on which are like a neoprene wetsuit type material. This whole unit lowers down, you step in, bring it back up and zip them in. Mm -hmm. It then fills up with air and then you can gradiate someone's weight bearing state or body weight anywhere as low as 20% of their body weight all the way up to full body weight. So again, very similar to the hydro pool where you can de-weight someone, someone who the consultant might have said, you're only allowed to put 30% body weight through that leg. We can take their body weight down to 30% and allow them to walk on here to do squats in that lower weight bearing status. So again, just allowing that early rehabilitation. And it makes jockeys recover faster, I imagine. This is partly why I assume that when you hear about jockeys who make these ridiculously fast recoveries after really bad injuries, it's down to equipment like this. And the body will heal in the time that it heals. A bone fracture, we can't speed up, but what we can do is prevent a lot of those secondary things occurring that the muscle wasting that goes along with being immobile for a period of time, the, the muscle tightness, some of the swelling that can occur with that. So if we can reduce those, that by the time the bone heals and they're able to get back racing, they're a lot closer to that higher level of fitness than had they just been sat at home for four weeks doing nothing. Let's talk about Oaksy House, because yeah. it's been so important in your life and your recovery process and the Injured Jockeys Fund is such a massive, I imagine, part of the way things have been for you in the last few years. Um, how much do you owe to them, do you think? A oh, huge amount, like huge amount. It's like second home a little bit. It's kind of nice because, um, uh, not that it's, it's just a break a little bit as well from, from home, because I, I still sort of live with my, I'm like 100 metres from my family home. We built a little, um, bungalow for me and um, sometimes you just need a break and coming here and topping up your rehab using the gym using the facilities and just like meeting people that you haven't seen for a long time like I've been in the waiting room and I've seen lads I haven't seen for like five years who've come in for a, with a broken arm or whatever and you, you just catch up with them and they'll say oh we'll go out for dinner tonight Ed and like it's been really good and when I did my walk around Newbury, I did that. Um, I did a lap of the paddock to raise funds. Um, uh, as soon as I did that AP 
came down to Oaksy House and was like, well done. Um, and then he was like, if you want to come up to the house for dinner, we'll, we'll do that. And like, ever since, like every time I come down now, he's like, give me a, give me a text and we'll organise it. And it's great. Like I've met him and like his family have like opened me into their, you know, into their house, into their home. And I've, I wouldn't have met them. And I've, I've met like George and I've met some really, really good people. And I, I've met a lad called uh, Ouija Davis on the injured jockey's holiday, and he's like huge character, and he's a lot he's a lot more injured than me in watching and seeing what he's achieved in his life. Like he's done more than most able-bodied people. So you, I have met some characters, and and I've had some good experiences out of my accident. Are you are you one of those people that is a kind of get up and go merchant? Is always something you're looking to do next, and given your injuries, do you feel as though it's opened new horizons for you to be able to try and prove to people that you can do other things? Hey, I keep mentioning him, I'm going to get stick from my brother, oh friend, AP McCoy. Um, <laughs> but he said to me like early on, you need a purpose. And that sort of stuck in my mind a little bit. Um, and you've got to have a goal really, especially because it gets boring. Rehab, it gets like quite tedious, like gym all the time. So having goals just small goals for me is quite important to just keep keep going but kind of the big breakthrough was really getting into wheelchair sports so when i got when i got into tennis and wheelchair rugby that was massive for me because i had something to get fit for and i've always liked sport as a as a child i love playing sport so having having that in my life has been quite a turning point i think so what kind of sport do you do now I got quite a good routine going. So Monday night I go to Gloucester and I play two hours of tennis. It started off with just two of us, but now there's like six of us in chairs and a, and a coach. And we play tennis on a Monday. Tuesday night I play wheelchair rugby at Worcester. Um, Wednesday I might go swimming. Um, Thursday I do like strength and conditioning um, for like an hour and a half and then Friday, I have like a day off from it, and then probably well deserved. Yeah, on the of it. and then I just you kind of have to keep going though, because if you don't do your rehab and you don't play sport, you, if you don't use it, you you lose it. And then they said that in hospital, you're like you need to keep pushing the boundaries of it. Um, and like I I follow a lot of people that have got similar injuries to me on Instagram, like Ed Jackson. He set up his own charity, Millimeters to Mountains, and he's gone on to do like amazing things. Seeing people like that keeps you pushing to get better and improve. And so, yeah, the people like that are a real inspiration to me. Whereas when I was riding, Richard Johnson was my hero, AP McCoy, Ruby Walsh, like those type were my like be all and end all, like I'm going to be like them. Mm. But now actually seeing someone recover from a spinal injury is far more impressive, I think, than being like champion jockey so many years running, I think. In terms of prognosis for the future, I have to say, having watched your walk around Newby Paradering since then, what was three years ago nearly, you've improved markedly. You're now walking on crutches. I know you switch between that and a wheelchair, but your movement's pretty amazing. Do you think you'll continue to, to, to improve and, and to progress in, in terms of your ability to walk? You can, you can always improve strength. So you can improve like a muscle if you like do weights, you can improve that side of it. And if you improve your muscles, you're gonna improve your, your mobility. But to be honest, after the, the, the surgeons were right, after two years, it, it definitely slowed up, but you can still keep, I think you can still keep improving if you keep pushing yourself in the gym and, 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 and keep sending those messages down to your legs. I still think you, I can Im make improvements. But I'll I'll always be I'll always need some form of assistance. Like I'll I'll never be off my crutches. Like I can walk so many yards without them, but it's very slow and not very safe. So I'll, and I learned quite quickly that I actually needed to use the wheelchair. Like at the very start, it was like you need to be out of that chair and you need to be up and about and you need to walk and everything. But I actually, I was coming to the end of the day and I was like, I was exhausted to, just to try and be on my feet. And I wasn't getting a lot done in the day. And the moment where I was like, kind of accepted and thought of the wheelchair as a bit of a tool to get from A to B, the better my life was really. And like I play sport in it. Um, 
I went to the I went for a meal with some friends the other day and um, from school, and you know they treat me like the old Ed really. And I went to get my crutches out, and they're like, "We haven't got time for that. Chuck them back in. Get the chair out. We need to get to this place quick." So that that you know they're, they're accepting of it, and and my parents now I think that generation they 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 were longer accepting me in using a chair than I was really. They it took my mum a while to say to to adapt to me using it, but I just treat it as a tool now. So I would say 90% of the time I'm in my chair, 10% of the time I'm up on my crutches or standing in my kitchen and cooking or whatever. So yeah, I, I learned to use it as a tool. And have you found different outlets like cooking and, and different activities that have kept you busy that you might not otherwise have done? Well, I, li I did live on my own. I, when I moved down to Devon for four years, I lived sort of I had to fend for myself, so I, so that side has not changed. But you you have to adapt because um, my hands are quite badly affected from my injury. You have to learn to chop things again. Um, like you basically, w when you first have your injury, you start again. It's like being a baby again. You have to learn to feed yourself. You have to learn to wash yourself. You have to learn different th side of things. But um, being actually in a wheelchair isn't the hardest part. It's there's a lot of things that people don't know unless you're in that situation. That come that come along with a spinal injury, so um, bladder and bowel uh, function, um, temperature, pain management, fatigue. There's a lot that comes with it that's probably worse than actually being in a chair. Like you get used to. If you spoke to somebody in a wheelchair, they'd rather have all that back than actually have their legs back half the time. You kind of you kind of adapt to being in a chair, but the other things that come with a spinal injury are far far worse and I'm fairly open about it as well because I think people need more education about spinal injuries and what comes with it. Like I had no clue, I just thought people in wheelchairs just couldn't walk properly but um, yeah there's a lot, there's a lot come with it. In terms of your future, what do you hope you can achieve going forward? Yeah I don't know what the future is going to hold but um, I'm definitely looking forward now whereas in the first couple of years I was always looking about thinking about my accident and poor me and poor you know why me but now I'm like what's out there you know our next stop here in the picturesque Lambourne countryside brings us to Baker McVeigh, one of the leading veterinary practices in the UK and worldwide. And I am going to talk to partner Ian Beamish about all things equine physiology. With your facilities you've got here, do you tend to do a bit of your work on site as well as going to the yards themselves? Where would you do your majority of, of We're entirely time? ambulatory here. Okay. So we do everything on the yards. We have mobile x-ray machines, ultrasound equipment, um, video endoscopes. So we will do everything we need to on the yard. We very much see ourselves as um, sports doctors that can go onto the yard and look at the individuals. We look after their day-to-day -day health and then their day-to-day -day injuries. And we can go fairly far along the line with the diagnosis of those injuries and then the rehabilitation beyond that. If we need to go to uh, a surgical facility then you know we're lucky to have several world-class surgical facilities within both this area and the wider kind of two-hour commute and they're staffed by some of the best surgeons in the world so that very much is not our prerogative. Our job is to be on the yards looking after the day-to-day -day interests of the horse. Yeah and it sounds similar to the recovery of jockeys we've just seen at Oaksey House given that medical advancement that uh, it might have taken, say, six months, ten years ago for a jockey to recover from a certain injury. Now that time is halved because everything can be done so much more quickly. Yeah, we're, we're always learning, that's the thing, you know. And uh, when you look back it, over any period of time, you realise just how much you've learned in that time. And you've got to keep an open mind when you're treating these animals because as we move forward, we're always learning. And the real, what I find very strange to look at is we're in the past, in 20 years' time, We'll look at where we are now and say, wow, how far we've come since then. And so we always have to be moving forward with the times and trying to work out how best to progress whilst we can. I'm looking around the room. There's some very famous racehorses on the walls, some of which, I, almost all of which, I imagine you've had something to do with their treatment. Yeah, absolutely. And like you say, we've, we have some very famous names and quite a few of them have gone on to be stallions as well. And we have a couple more to add to the stallion roster as well this year. So we're... We're very lucky to look after those animals and I think you know that uh, Lambourne is the value of the racehorse and some of the world's best horses are trained here and um, to get to look after them is, is really what we're here for. 
when you get a horse who perhaps is more talented or more prestigious than others, does it pile the pressure on a little bit more to, to make sure you get everything right? I think that pressure's always there. I think it's certainly nice working with those elite athletes. You know, I'm, I'm a big Liverpool fan myself and I always kind of imagine myself looking after Mo Salah or Stevie <laughs> Gerrard and it kind yeah. of being, that's our job. But um, I think you know, the horses are all essentially, you know, they're equipped with the same apparatus. So when you then get there, you're dealing with the same, the same issues and the level of horse isn't always that important. And with these really top thoroughbreds, given their physiology and how advanced it is, does it sometimes make finding out what's wrong with these horses a little bit easier because they are so kind of fit and well built? I think what we find is the, the horses that are, are higher rated tend to run faster by their very nature. And so they stress the physiological body systems to the limit, whether that's physically through tendons and bones and ligaments or through their, you know, their heart and their lungs. They're operating at the very limit and certainly the horses that are winning those group races are essentially, you know, they're freaks of nature. They are the, the best of the best and they're in, incredible athletes. Just a stone's throw from Baker McVeigh is Owen Burroughs' yard and Ian took us down there to assess a horse who is recovering from injury. This is an individual that actually injured his um, suspensory ligament and where that inserts onto the back of his cannon bone at the end of last season. And he's been going through a rehabilitation program um, whilst we allow that to repair. And we're going to re-examine him today because he's due to start canter exercise. So firstly, we want to make sure that he's moving well and he's sound. And then we want to check him clinically and make sure that there's, there's no pain or heat there anymore. And then we'll take him through and we'll re-x-ray him to make sure that we can see that we're getting good bone healing. Mm -hmm. And that'll give us the all clear to be able to start him back in some more exercise, increasing his paces and hopefully get him ready for the season ahead. Brilliant. And what's your first impression now looking at him? Good so far. He's walking well, but I think what we really need to see is him trot. So if you can trot away, please. Thank you. So what we're really looking for is, is his head carriage. For a fall limb lameness, what we want to know is that he's got a steady head carriage. They mm -hmm. tend to nod when they're lame and they go down on the good leg and up on the, up on the sore leg and he's moving well today. Yeah, he looks good, doesn't he? He looks very good. I'm very pleased with his progress so far. And one more time, please. And it's like a happy horse as well, which is <laughs> well, an that's advantage. What we, what we try to aim for, really, I think, you know, that when you look at the human statistics, there's anywhere between 30% and 75% of human runners mm -hmm. suffer an injury each year. And you know, it's no different with horses really in that we're dealing with elite athletes and they're going to get injuries. It's our job to detect them as early as possible and do everything we can to make sure they have a full recovery. Yeah, we've just seen you x-ray this lovely three-year-old colt. Could you have a look at the results and, and tell us what you think? Yeah, I can. So what we're looking at here, this is, the, this is his leg here. This is his knee, more specifically. And he's got two rows of carpal bones here. This is the equivalent of the human wrist. And then we're looking at his cannon bone just below here. And this area at the top is where his suspensory ligament starts. It comes off here and comes down to his fetlock. And what we're looking at here is this bone area where it's whiter compared to the bone next to it. That's where his injury was, and he actually had a, a piece of bone pull away from here and move down. So what we're seeing here is good healing, and as we scroll through the images, we can see that we're getting healing through the same area on the images below. So I'm happy to get this horse back into doing a little bit more exercise, and we can now really begin his rehab proper as he starts to get back into quicker paces. So you must be pretty happy with that, because from you know, an untrained eye like mine, it looks fairly healthy. Yeah, it's, it's getting there. What we need to do now is to load that bone, to teach the bone what forces it's going to face in real life and when he starts racing again. And that is a, that's a slow and steady um, pathway to take to make sure we get him to a point where he's going to withstand those forces at full, full tilt. OK, well, fingers crossed his uh, gradual progress can become a little bit more fast. Indeed. Yeah. Over to the trainer. <laughs> That's it for the latest episode of This Racing Life. Many thanks indeed to Oaksey House, to Ed Barrett and to all those who work behind the scenes and indeed to Baker McVeigh and to Ian Beamish. From all of us here on This Racing Life, it's goodbye. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.